Welcome to Around the Empire. I'm your host, Joanne Leon. Middle East expert Joshua Landis joins the show to discuss the recent summit in Istanbul, Europe's move to join the Astana process, the war in Syria, the Hasogji affair, and the forces aligning against the current U.S. foreign policy in the region. Professor Landis is the director of the Center for Middle East Studies at the University of Oklahoma. He spent much of his childhood in Saudi Arabia and Lebanon, later lived in several other countries in the Middle East, including Syria and Turkey. He's a frequent interview guest in numerous media outlets in the United States and abroad. You can find his work at his blog, Syria Comment, follow him on Twitter at Joshua underscore Landis, and on Facebook. We recorded this interview on November 1st, 2018. Professor Landis, it's great to have you back on Around the Empire. It's been a while. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Joanne. It's a pleasure being here. So there was a summit in Istanbul, and the leaders of Russia, Turkey, Germany, and France were there. And right after that summit, you wrote a thread on Twitter that got a lot of traction. And um, I was very happy to have it, too. The way you boiled it down was really fantastic. If it's okay... With you, I have that thread right here, and I'll read through it real quick, and then we can talk about it further, and also we can we can throw in a little bit of background on what the situation in Syria was like before that summit. You know, for those who aren't aware or aren't caught up, I mean, I think our listeners are pretty well caught up on this, but you know, you never know when you have some new listeners, or so we'll just we'll just sort of spice it with some background too. And also for our listeners, pretty much everything that we reference will be linked in the show notes in the reference links for your convenience. So, okay, if I read this thread? Please. Okay. This is on October 27th. And uh, Professor Landis says, the real importance of France and Germany going to Turkey to meet Putin and Erdogan is that they are effectively hiving off from the U.S. by joining the Astana process. They are breaking boycott of Syria while preserving the quote-unquote need for elections talking point. We may safely conclude that Assad will not permit any quote-unquote political process or constitutional committee to dislodge him or bring members of the opposition to power in Damascus. He has won the war. Europe is frightened for its security. It does not want the refugee situation nor the jihadi situation in Europe to be made worse by an Idlib invasion. This is why Europe is in Istanbul. As Macron said, the Idlib deal may be sustained. Russia has reiterated that the Idlib deal is temporary. The jihadis must be killed or arrested, but Russia wants the EU to engage and commit to reconstruction aid for Syria which can help refugees return. Europe is angry at the U.S. for unilaterally scuttling the Iran deal and possibly crushing the Iranian economy, which could further destabilize the region and lead to an even greater refugee flow from Europe, toward Europe. The U.S. policy is very bad for Europe. Turkey, Syria, Iran, and Russia want to drive the U.S. out of North Syria and end its alliance with the YPG. This occurs. There are many competing agendas among the different sides in Istanbul, but this is an important step forward, breaking with America's stated goal of boycotting Syria so long as Assad remains in power. It's a logical step forward after many Gulf countries, such as Bahrain and Kuwait, took measures to recognize the present reality of the Assad victory and work toward the normalization of relations between their countries. In some respects, The Istanbul summit is simply reality asserting itself after Assad's military victory. All Syria's neighbors have an interest in reestablishing a stable region, taking care of jihadists and security, and improving economic and political conditions for refugee return. In other respects, it's a response to the U.S. skewed foreign policy, 
the U.S. policy of arming uh, the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia and crushing Iran is bad for stability in the Middle East and Europe. The Khashoggi affair, I, cause I, uh, yeah, it's hard to pronounce Khashoggi. Yes, that's the the way that some Saudis I heard pronouncing it. <laughs> Khashoggi. Yeah, Khashoggi. Khashoggi. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I'd like to pronounce it the way they pronounce it. Khashok- Hashuka is spoon, and Hashokshi is a spoon maker. I saw that thread that you did on Twitter. What? That was fascinating, too. <laughs> anyway, there's one more sentence. The Hashokshi affair highlights the weakness of U.S. policy. It provides Europe an incentive to step out alone. So this was a fantastic summary. It's really kind of a little article in itself. Um, so talk to me. What? Give us some more information about this. Well, the big the big story in this Istanbul conference, this Istanbul summit, as it was called, which brought together the usual suspects of Erdogan and Putin, who've been really the the spearheading the resolution of the Syrian crisis, and but this time, both Germany, Merkel was there, and so was Macron from France, and which, that's a big deal. Yes, and that was a big deal. And so I was trying to highlight why that was a big deal, because Europe has shunned and given a cold shoulder to this Russian organized process of trying to deal with a war, which brought Turkey and Iran together, and they they have been really spearheading this. And the Geneva process, which had been really um, orchestrated by the United States, had become unimportant. And had really fallen off the face of the map. And so Europe and America didn't have a role. Of course, American foreign policy is to try to squeeze Syria economically, uh, keep sanctions on, not allow international agencies to provide money to Assad for, for reconstruction of Syria, and to deny Syria the northern provinces, including the whole region north of the Euphrates, which has serious, most of its oil, its best agriculture, and much of its water. And so by denying that and giving it to the Kurds, in a sense, and the, and the Syrian, what they call the Syrian democratic forces, um, this would impoverish the Assad regime in the hopes that Assad would cave in, that the Russians would kick him out, that something would happen that would cause regime change. The the stated goal was that the United States wants the UN invited to Damascus to carry out democratic free and fair elections that would replace Assad. Uh, None of which is gonna happen, but um, it provides a humanitarian argument for a really strict economic sanctioning uh, and regional slice up of Syria, and of course the continued American presence in the north of Syria. So all of that is justified as America squeezes Iraq, and of course we are on the verge of seeing the new uh, sanctions imposed on Iraq, uh, on, on excuse me, new sanctions imposed on Iran, which are supposed to bring Iran to its knees economically. So this is a part of a larger American foreign policy to really hurt. Iranian Iran and its allies, Syria, hurt Russia, and to help America's allies, Saudi Arabia and Israel, win the struggle for dominance in the Middle East. And that's why having Macron and Merkel turn up in Istanbul, really abandoning the American strategy and embracing Russia and Erdogan was really quite shocking. Yeah, and you called it, and I thought this was probably the most brilliant thing in the whole thread. You said this is them by de de facto joining the Astana process. Yes, the Astana process was, is named after Astana, where where, um, Russia had first met with Iran and Turkey to set up a parallel organization for solving the Syrian problem that parallel the Geneva conventions that had been held because there had been a series of three, four 
meetings in Geneva with the Syrian opposition and, and Assad people to try to force Assad to leave Syria. That had not worked. Russia started this Astana process, a parallel process that would leave Assad in power and, in fact, guarantee his survival and then really uh, sort out the defeat of the Syrian opposition. And that process has been the more successful one. And Assad is here, he's winning. And really what we're trying to figure out for Idlib province, the last province where there are opposition members, is how to get them really to step down and to put down their arms and reconcile with the Syrian government, which which is a tantamount to defeat. And that Idlib province deal that was made, um, you know, basically Idlib was surrounded and the Syrian army with this, you know, air support from Russia and I think ground support too, were ready to move in on Idlib. And there was really no way that these, the remaining rebels, and for the most part, these are the most extreme ones because as we all know, uh, they were transported there when they made deals. So the Idlib deal then, you know, stopped in its tracks. And all of a sudden there was this deal between Russia and Turkey. And that was in September And there was a deadline of October 15th, most of which the deal that most people seem to think Turkey would not be able to achieve what they promised to achieve by October 15th. So all of a sudden we were back in the same situation. Um, Russia and Syria were going to move in again. And this is when uh, Germany and France, apparently Macron seems to be the one putting the most emphasis on this is, you know, we can't have this. It's going to create another massive um, you know, wave of refugees are going to go right back over the border into Turkey, and then they're going to end up in Europe, and a, quite a big number of them. And I would think that that would be a big problem for Turkey too. They've already got a lot of refugees, so they use that as the sort of the catalyst for pushing this thing, shoving this thing ahead. And they removed the precondition, the one precondition that seemed to be holding up the whole works, which was Assad must go. I mean, this we've been hearing for years now. Is that kind of accurate? Totally. That's completely accurate. And and Europe was enticed into this uh, in order to back up Turkey, because it looked like Turkey was going to, uh, could not withstand the pressure of Russia and Assad. Russia and Assad, Assad in particular, wants Idlib back. He says, I'm going to reassert Syrian sovereignty over my province. This is a Syrian province, and we're not going to let the Turks keep it. We're not going to let a bunch of rebels set up a parallel Syria there, which will be a a thorn in our side for the rest of our life. We're going to take this. Of course, there there, there are over 2 million people in this province. Any assault on it would lead to massive fighting, which Russia and Syria would win pretty handily. And caused a stampede of people out of this province into Anatolia. They would scatter around Anatolia and many of them would find their way to Europe. So this was going to completely destabilize Anatolia, but also possibly Europe. And Europe's in the middle of this, just like the United States is, this terrible struggle between populists and liberals. What's the future of European Union? All that's going to be thrown up in the air if there's another cataclysmic wave of refugees or bombings by terrorists. So Europe had a, has a lot at stake and they had to get over to Istanbul. They have to keep this political process in Idlib. They had to keep it going because otherwise if there's an invasion, all hell breaks loose. So they were there to show their support for Russia and Turkish Entente and to keep Assad from pushing invasion. And that's what they did. And it was successful. And so far, the worst has been avoided. The problem with all of this is that it hasn't solved them. It hasn't solved the main issue, which is right. what you do with well over 10,000 uh, jihadists who are related or affiliated or have been affiliated with Al Qaeda, who are sitting in this province and Turkey does not have the will or the ability to disarm them. And Syria is just, is basically tapping its toes, waiting to go in and kill these people. And so far, we've got this 
interim agreement with a buffer zone. But it doesn't solve the major political problem of how do you get this province back into the hands of Assad before he invades it? And what do you do with all these fighters and their families and families of other fighters that America supported, that Turkey supported, that Saudi Arabia supported, who who all have a stake and could be prosecuted by the Syrian government and, and, and you know, imprisoned, bad things would happen to them. And the, the rest of the West, plus the Gulf and Turkey, all feel responsible. And they are responsible. They pay these people for years to fight against Assad. So if Assad goes in there and says, you're a bunch of traitors and I'm going to hang you, um, which, you know, in some ways is is clearly what he wants to do and, and is, you know, would be practical under Syrian law, the West doesn't want that. It, it has supported these people as freedom fighters. And so it feels guilty, as well as having all these practical problems of, of uh, fighters scattered across Europe. So this is this is the dilemma, and we still haven't solved it. Right. And also the dilemma of separating the bad guys from the worst guys, the kind of thing that's been going on for for years now. And I would think that one of the things that one of the reasons why Turkey can't resolve this is that they would fear a backlash, right? What if these fighters, I mean, these are, these are the best, most dedicated, most dangerous fighters. And if they turn on Erdogan, you know, that could be spell big trouble for Turkey. And I would think other countries in the region have the same fears. So, you know, what is this, this, what is the solution to that? I mean, does well, anyone have it? Uh, Assad thinks he has it, which is to just take the province back by force and to uh, go and chase these guys down. You know, the, the, the same thing that the United States did in northern Syria when they fought ISIS. And that that's, you know, ultimately the United States fa- faced the same problem in cities like Raqqa or Mosul. And they chose just to bomb the hell out of them. And um, it, it didn't turn out very well, but it was a solution, if you will. Um, at any rate, that's that, that's the dilemma. I mean, uh, Turkey would like to set up a separate little province, no-fly zone, where these people would basically be left on their own to try to resolve their own problems over time. And and, and it, you know, Russia has continually insisted that everybody agree that Syrian sovereignty be respected. And Assad has insisted on that too. And that means, you know, what does that, what does that ultimately mean? Syrian sovereignty being respected. It means that Syria takes over that province and everybody has signed on to that. Even the United States insists that Syrian sovereignty be respected, at least in its talking points. Of course, it wants a change of government first before that sovereignty is respected. And, uh, and, but ultimately, Every single actor is upholding international law, which, or theoretically upholds international law, which suggests that Syria cannot be divided up by a foreign power, and uh, it's a sovereign state. Now, you mentioned also, you know, east of the Euphrates, some people call it northeast Syria, some people call it northern Syria. Uh, I mean, I always kind of wondered why Syria and Russia didn't put more pressure, on, more focus on getting that territory back. And we seem to be pretty well dug in there. So this summit also, is it also saying that, is it an opposition to the US, Saudi, Israel, Israeli plan? And I guess you really should put the British in with that too, uh, to keep that territory. And uh, is it a rebellion against that plan? Does it make it untenable now? It's not untenable as long as American military is willing to, um, you know, plant its flag there and defend it because nobody's going to defeat America. They can harass America. And that's what looks like uh, Turkey, Iran, Syria, and even Russia are, are, are trying to put their heads together and figure out how to make America's life untenable in North Syria. And we have to remember that America still rules 30% of Syrian territory. That's that big swath of land north of the Euphrates, uh, and it's the northeast of Syria. 
and as well as a big hunk of land around Kunf. This is a little bit lower down on the border with Iraq, right where Jordan and Iraq meet. And that's because America wants to stop the highway there, control the highway between Baghdad and Damascus. And so it has it has created a no-fly zone in that area. So America controls quite a bit of Syria. And so far, there hasn't been a real organized opposition because the few probing measures that Syria and Russia have made to try to penetrate that area, America has smashed them and killed, you know, almost 200 Russian mercenaries, we believe, in one one incidence. So this is the, uh, that's the problem. But Turkey just this week uh, launched a bunch of artillery into a northern town inside Syria, killing a bunch of people. And America's protested this. The Kurdish-dominated government there has protested this. And uh, and so Turkey is clearly putting up the heat because they don't want America there arming Kurds who are related to the PKK. That's the, the major terrorist group that has been plaguing Turkey for 40 years. And Turkey has stated that this is the last chance for America to withdraw and that they're going to begin to attack northern Syria. Uh, we don't know if they're bluffing. There are obviously talks going on between Turkey and the United States. Turkey has many reasons not to annoy the United States any more than it has to right now. But it's a very tense situation. I I think this some of the way things lined up. I read this article by M.K. Badra Kumar, who's the uh, former Indian Am- India's ambassador to Turkey uh, some de- couple decades ago. But he, he actually, I mean, he, his conclusion is that he says Erdogan and Turner, or at least part of them had always hankered for recognition by the West when he sought Turkey's historic leadership role in the Middle East and uniqueness to act as a bridge between the West and the region. Equally, Trump is eternally grateful to Erdogan to refrain from spilling the beans on the Hachaki. <laughs> I'm going to say Kashogi because I can't pronounce yeah, the other one. Fine. I got to practice it. Uh, spilling the beans on the Kashogi affair and helping him finesse a major crisis for the presidency on the foreign policy front. Suffice this to say, this transition in the U.S.-Turkey tough love can profoundly affect the geopolitics in the Middle East. Provided, of course, Washington plays its cards carefully in regard to Erdogan's wish list on a host of pending issues, including some of great sensitivity. Syria is somewhere at the top of Erdogan's priorities. Howsoever unpalatable it may appear, Erdogan will expect the Americans to throw their Syrian Kurdish allies under the bus. Now, this is not the only um, place analysis where I've read ties the Khashoggi affair to Syria. And I've personally always felt that there was something much bigger underlying that whole thing. You know, essentially... The way to to think about this is that President Trump has gambled America's future on its relationship with Saudi Arabia. Right. And he has made Saudi Arabia the central tent peg for American foreign policy in the larger Middle East to attack Iran mainly, but also to pursue this anti-Iranian policy in Syria. That means siding with Kurdish nationalism in Northern Syria and getting the Kurds to side with America to set up a, a, quasi, you know, a quasi little statelet in Northern Syria that would allow America to build bases and project power. This left America become hostile towards Turkey. Now, Turkey realizes this and thinks Saudi Arabia is getting the jump on us. Turkey has always been a central pillar of American policy, a member of NATO, Angelic Air Base, so forth and so on. As American Turkish relations deteriorate, Turkey can see that it's going to be isolated. That way, Europe can push it around. The United States is not going to back up Turkey. And Saudi Arabia will become more powerful and get its way. So with the Khashoggi affair, Turkey, in a sense, is kicking the legs out from underneath MBS, 
Mohammed bin Salman, the crown prince who holds the power in, in Saudi Arabia. And he's saying, look it to America, if you will, and to the West. You think I'm bad? I'm running a country with elections. I'm running a, a country that's the seventh largest economy in the world. Uh, uh, no, some, excuse me. The, the seventh largest, I think sixth or seventh largest economy in Europe and the 17th largest economy in the world. I have a big middle class. The, Turkey is a major player. And you're gambling on a little desert kingdom, Saudi Arabia. That's foolish. And here's why. And then he, he gets the crown prince of Saudi Arabia by the short hairs. I mean, I, he, he's got him yeah. it, it, with this murder in his own, in the consulate in Istanbul. And, and it's a major, you know, it's a major insult to Erdogan. Here's the Saudis who come traipsing in and they kill a friend of the president right in, you know, right in the middle of Turkey. And so they're, they're going to, they're, uh, they are, you know, carrying out not only a rather sophisticated foreign policy move by this, but they're also, it's a question of honor and all these other things. But they're taking down Saudi Arabia which they're doing very successfully because, boy, has everybody jumped on this. You know, all the Democrats are seeing this as a pre-election, you know, godsend to torture President Trump and show, say, you know, your foreign policy in the Middle East is completely stupid and you should be embracing human rights and why can't you condemn the Saudis and blah, blah, blah. So, they, it, you know, Trump has got the immigration issue, which he's playing for all they want. But the, the Democrats have the Khashoggi affair. And and so this is, you know, it's become this much bigger thing. It's about in turn, it's about Middle Eastern politics and the competition between Turkey and Saudi Arabia. It's between Democrats and Republicans in America. And it's about what is ultimately, um, what, what kind of foreign policy does America want to carry out in the Middle East? And I think most policymakers in Washington today are saying we cannot put all of our eggs in a Saudi basket. MBS is untrustworthy. He's rash. He's not a reformer. He's going to bring down that kingdom. And when he does, if he does, I mean, should he? Let's say it's only, you know, a 10 or 20 percent possibility. But should he really screw up the stability of the kingdom? We don't have any place in the Middle East. We've got nothing. So we better keep our good relations with Turkey. We've got to keep an alternative. And that would have to be Turkey. And, and Erdogan smells that. And he's laying out the red carpet. And he's saying he's making some demands. Get out of North Syria. Stop arming the Kurds. And we can go back to being best of buds. I would say if it works, it's a... It was a brilliant move, actually. Whether I agree with it or not, um, that's not even part of the issue. I do tend to agree with it. But uh, it's it's really a brilliant... If you look at all the moving pieces here, either how someone planned it or how someone took advantage of a, a situation and realized what what they needed to do to to break this stalemate that and, and just to shift the shift the, the controlling powers or keep the rising powers from going in the direction they were going in. It was going to literally blow up the region. I mean, God only knows what would happen if we went forward with the way that the Saudis, the Israelis, and I keep saying the, the, the British and the United States, the uh, war hawks, you know, the uh, wh whatever, the war party, whoever's right. pushing things in this direction. I mean, it was a, a, just an almost unimaginable danger and risk and what, where they were taking us. Well, I think you're absolutely right. The, our our anti-Iran policy is extremely foolish and it's, it's recapitulating almost every one of the errors we've made over the last 15 years in the Middle East. And, and the biggest error is that we're pushing Iran towards economic collapse and we can do it possibly. Our, our sanctions are having devastating effect on the Iranian economy. Now, Iran is a country of close to 90 million people. It's a major player in the region. If Iran were to collapse economically, or let's say we were successful in producing uh, terrible demonstrations throughout Iran, uh, driven by economic 
privation and the government were to stumble and civil war were to break out in some way in, in Iran. I don't know if that is even a, is slightly likely, but it were to happen, this would be a disaster for everybody. The Middle East is already on its knees. There are so many migrants around. Uh, little regimes like the Jordanian regime, the Lebanese government, uh, all are hanging by a thread. They've had terrible demonstrations. People are pushed to the limits economically. Nobody knows how to feed themselves. Look at Egypt. If you had Iran collapse at this point, it would be a disaster. And, and, and America is somehow thinking that this kind of creative chaos is going to lead to a better Middle East. It seems to me um, it's dumbfounding, frankly. Especially given the history. We've done this before. You know, we pushed, we pushed a number of Middle Eastern countries to breaking point, or we've kicked over their governments, as in Libya and in Iraq. And we didn't get anything better. It, it produced civil war. We've got very fragile states from one end of the Middle East to the other. And I think if, if we've learned one lesson, we've learned the lesson that a fragile state is better than no state. And that if you kick these governments over, you don't get a better Jeffersonian democracy that's going to pop up and replace them. What you get is fragments and, and lots of different people who don't necessarily feel like Libyans or Syrians or Afghans or Iraqis fighting each other for power. It kicks off a great sorting out, as I've called it, where you get ethnic cleansing, minorities get cannibalized, and it, it unleashes terrible forces that don't need to be unleashed. So better to stick with the states, even the ones you don't like, and allow a slower, less violent process of change to work its way out. Okay. I think you have to run. I think it's uh, that's good. Short sure. time to go, right? Yeah, I've got like ten more things here I could talk to you about. Maybe we'll no, pick it up again. Too much. We 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 covered a lot of a lot of. Uh, yeah. In fact, the last half of that was in many ways more interesting than the first half because we were just talking about the bigger ideas rather than the you know who's on first. With yeah, I always I'm never satisfied with the details. I'm always like. I don't know whether I should do this or not, but I always kind of want to know well, it's what's really going on. You know, we've got different audiences. It's hard to know which. Uh... Well, then we covered both. <laughs> Good. Excellent. Well, it was a okay. lot of fun talking with you, Joanne. And thank you so much. Thank you so much, too. And um, hope to talk to you again soon. All right. You too. Take Bye. care. Yeah. And that's our show. Thank you for listening, and a special thank you to Professor Joshua Landis. Find his work and links to his media interviews at his blog, Syria Comment. Follow him on Twitter at Joshua underscore Landis, and find him on Facebook. The Around the Empire podcast is independent media, and it's brought to you with the help of our generous donors. You can pitch in at patreon.com slash aroundtheempire or by doing one-time donation on our website, aroundtheempire.com. Follow us on Twitter, at Around the Empire. Follow me on Twitter at Joanne Leon, L-E-O-N, J-O-A-N-N-E-L-E-O-N. It helps a lot if you uh, hit the subscribe button on our YouTube channel, and that's free. The channel is growing, but we still need more subscribers to get the uh, live stream super chat feature. Also, use the thumbs up icon to like the individual videos. Subscribe to our podcast on your preferred podcatcher app. We're on iTunes, Apple Podcasts, uh, Spotify, iHeartRadio, Stitcher, others, pretty much all of them. And if you like the podcast, take a minute to leave uh, a nice review. It helps a lot. We also have a page on Facebook. See you next time. Take care, everyone.